Okay, welcome chemistry students. This is chapter eight. Dr. Ross is with you looking at chapter eight of our Chem 65 class. The topics today are going to be light. So we're moving into um, quantum mechanical type topics. So we're looking at light, we're looking at quantum numbers, some electron configurations, and periodic trends. Um, so definitely uh, a bit mind bending uh, with these these topics. All right. So without further ado, let's get going. Okay. So light or electromagnetic radiation um, obeys certain equations that we are probably some of them I think we'll be familiar with, like this one displayed on the screen right now. So this is just the speed is distance by time, distance over time equation, right? So since everyone was in grade school, maybe some of you are still in grade school, I don't know. But since everyone was in grade school, you've known that speed uh, is distance P in a time, right? Speed is distance over time. So here we have light speed. So light speed is C, distance is uh, a length and length we call lambda and frequency nu is um, one over time. So again, speed is distance over time, C is lambda nu. This is just the, um, I guess, college version of speed is distance over time, all right. We have to, so basically the story goes, and you really don't need the story in Chem 65, to be honest, but it's kind of awkward to introduce something without the story. The story goes around 1900, physicists thought that everything that was needing to be known was pretty much known. Classical mechanics worked, Newtonian physics seemed to explain the world around us. And they were about to sign off on, okay, we've done science now, next. And then a couple of niggling observations couldn't be explained with classical mechanics. So classical mechanics is the mechanics of continuous energy. Um, black body radiation couldn't be explained by classical mechanics. Specific heat couldn't be explained by classical mechanics. Um, the photoelectric effect couldn't be explained by classical mechanics. So it, it started to worry some people. And one of those people it worried was a guy called Max Planck, who was a German physicist around the turn of the 20th century. So about, literally around 1900. And he solved, again, we don't need all the detail. You'll see all the detail in, in Jenkins. But just to justify what we will do here, I'll give you some of the background story. Um, he realized that the only way to explain the data of black body radiation was to quantize energy. He didn't know why it had to be quantized. He just, he just knew as a brute fact, if I do it, it works. And if I don't do it, it doesn't work. So that's where the, the name quantum mechanics came from. Quantum is a piece or a quantity. So instead of the energy of, instead of continuous energy, classical mechanics, we have discrete quantized energy or quantum mechanics. Okay, so rather than waves, we have particles and therein lies um, a dichotomy. We actually have neither nor, we have both. So the reality is there's a wave nature of reality and there's a particle nature of reality. Um, so particles have wave character, waves have particle character. So um, things have been interesting ever since. So black body radiation, uh, a black body is any object that can emit and absorb energy uh, perfectly. You can think of a hot piece of metal glowing. You know, if you put a hot piece of metal in a furnace and it glows red hot, you can think of that as a black body. Um, so Planck quantized energy 
so he said that energy comes in pieces called quanta and again i've got much more well-developed videos already posted on youtube for my students so they i have no doubt i've watched all of them and taken copious notes how many times do i have to hit the annotation pen before it actually annotates there you go okay so energy comes in multiples of quanta so h nu is a quanta or a piece or a quantity um i guess quanta is plural so i should have written quantum or singular oh. quantum all right singular okay so energy comes in pieces and if we remember our previous equation so we've got e is h nu energy comes in pieces pieces called h nu where h is something called Planck's constant nu is frequency or reciprocal time and we saw in the previous slide that c is lambda nu so if we solve for nu then nu is c over lambda and then if we insert nu back in here we get e is hc over lambda All right, so that's this equation here. So energy is HC over lambda, where H is Planck's constant, C is light speed. Okay, so we're asked the question, what's the energy in joules per photon and in kilojoules per mole of ultraviolet light with a wavelength of 285 nanometers? So the wavelength of light, so if wave is literally like a sine wave oscillating about a median point, then from any point to its next identical point along in the wave, this would be the wavelength lambda, right? Um, so, and we, we can see from the relationship that the longer the wavelength, the smaller the energy. So energy is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Anyway, so we've been asked a question here in green. We're going to use our new equation, E is H c over lambda and again we construct the equation backwards so that when we read it forwards it makes sense so the first thing i need joules per photon i need joules per photon here a photon is just h nu uh, by definition these equations are always per photon uh, you have to scale them to a mole of photons if you want to but they come out the box being one quantum or one photon. Photon and quantum can be used interchangeably. Okay, so I need joules per photon. So I know that one quantum or one photon has this Planck's constant value. So this is where our input of energy comes from. Planck's constant has units of joule seconds. So we have joule seconds per quantum or per photon. So one quantum or one photon is a multiple of Planck's constant. That's H. We have light speed, which is almost three by 10 to the eight meters per second. So that's where this value comes from. And then I want to just make the units make sense. So my input question had nanometers as the input, but my definition of light speed is in meter. So I convert meter to nanometer. And I use a metric conversion. So there's a billion nanometers in a meter. That's what this thing is here. And I just do that so that my units make sense. So I can cancel my nanometers with my meter. The own and my seconds with my seconds. The only unit that survives is joule per photon. So I get 6.9699 by 10 to the minus 19 joules per photon. This order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 19, uh, joules. This is pretty common. This is the order of magnitude that I would recommend you probably get a good feel for. You know, how much energy is a typical photon? It's about 10 to the minus 19 joules. Just to give you a frame of reference, a joule is about a heartbeat, a human heartbeat. So you'd need 10 to the positive 19 heartbeat, uh, sorry, 10 to the positive 19 photons worth of energy to have one human heartbeat 
So just to give you a frame of reference, heartbeats is about a joule. Um, if I take that energy per photon and I scale it by Avogadro's number, I can get the energy per mole of photons. And they requested kilojoule, so I can just convert joule to kilojoule at the end. Uh, so I can get from moles worth, I can get uh, hundreds of kilojoules. Um, so anyway, the important thing is, here is that the equations that we use, they're always by default one quantum. If you want a moles worth of quanta, you have to scale it by Avogadro's number. Okay. Um, this is the Rydberg frequency. So uh, let's see, this duplicates several times. Let me see where it last duplicates. Uh, here. So basically everything, I've just skipped over a couple of slides. I'll go back to this one in a, yeah, that's why I'll start with this one. But there's an equation that will repeat over several slides. So there's no point harking over it multiple times. Okay. So we have quantum mechanics around 1910-ish or 1913 here. So it's about 1910. Niels Bohr and friends in Europe realized that the Rutherford model of the atom, which was a classical model, you know, an electron, a nucleus, uh, it couldn't be true, right? If energy was really quantized, we had to quantize the atom as well. So Bohr came up with an idea to quantize the atom and he was inspired by the solar system. So if you imagine, instead of our tiny nucleus at the center of an atom, we imagine the sun at the center of, an, of, of our solar system. The planets don't smash into the nucleus because they're in a, uh, an orbit. So he used that analogy. Well, if I want to keep the electrons from smashing into the nucleus of an atom, they have to be moving in fixed orbits. So the planetary model of the atom was born. Uh, it's not true by today's standards, but it's a useful early attempt to quantize energy in an atom. So we have these concentric circles uh, increasing in energy value. So n equals one is the grand state. n equals two is the first excited state. n equals three is the second excited state, et cetera. And these rings increase like layers of an onion. Uh, in this course, it doesn't matter if the rings get closer, get closer together, farther apart. We'll worry about that in Gen Chem if we get there. But the fact that there's like a layered structure to an atom is more than enough at this stage for us. This is our first quantum number. So N is our first quantum number, and it's called the principal quantum number. Get the old annotation tool. Come on, Zoomy. N is the principal quantum number. Principal as in high school principal, like the main, the big cheese, uh, the main event, principal quantum number. The principal quantum number is also called the energy. As you can see here, these are energy levels. Importantly for a chemist, they're also the period number. So we have seven periods in the periodic table. You won't be that shocked to learn that there are seven periods in atoms. Okay, so principal quantum number N is the energy level. It's the period number. It's also called the shell. If you call it the shell, you're probably older, but you know, some people are old. And that's okay. They call it the shell. Uh, okay. And we can have transitions between shells, right? So we can absorb energy by absorbing, you know, if I absorb a wave, a photon e equals h nu, if I absorb energy, I can promote my electron from, so for example, if my electrons at the n equal three level, and I absorb a photon of light, I can increase my energy level to the n equals four level. 
If I then at some other point decay back down, back to the n equals three level, I can release that as another photon of light. So Bohr's model of the atom became very successful because it explained light. And in Chem 65, we want to do a couple of rudimentary calculations using uh, this equation. So just to annotate back because um, the kind of scattered over a couple of different slides now. You know, if we had, let's say, the n equals, well, sorry, which do we have? Let's say we have the n equals two level and the n equals three level. Um, then in this scenario, I can calculate the energy difference between two energy levels uh, as a transition of an electron between orbits. So here, I'm starting at the tail of the arrow. So this would be my N initial. This is my initial energy value. And I'm finally ending up at the head of the arrow at my final energy value. Okay. Now, personally, the way I do this equation will look a bit different. So in my other videos that I've posted to my students, I write uh, this. They're the same. They just look different. So just to be consistent with the way I do it elsewhere. So if you know math, and you definitely should if you're in this class, then I, I basically put a minus sign in front of the 2.179, which is just the Rydberg constant RH. And I switch the order of the I and the F. So I have NF minus NI, and I have a minus sign in front of the RH. That way you get the same delta E. Um, of course, if I do it this way, it has to be superior. Um, this is the common textbook way that you'll see it done in the blue box. And as somebody that's been involved in making textbooks, trust me, it's edited that way. Most professors wouldn't write it that way. So it gets edited to make it look like that way. But this way makes a lot more sense. Um, to a chemist. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Pick one, you'll get the same answer. Um, so here's a sample calculation. So what photon wavelength is required to promote an electron in the n equals one orbit of a hydrogen atom to the n equals five orbit? Okay, so we have Rydberg's constant, the 2.179 by 10 to the minus 18 joules. We have our n i squared, uh, one over n i squared minus one over n f squared in parentheses. So let's plug the numbers in. So our initial energy level is one. So we have one over one squared. Our final energy level is five. So we have one over five squared. We do the bracket first, multiply it by Rydberg's constant, and we get 2.09184 by 10 to the minus 18 joules. So that's our energy difference between the n equals one and n equals five orbit. We can take the absolute value of that. So these parallel lines mean take the absolute value, just in case it was negative. Um, take the absolute value and we can feed it into the E is HC over lambda equation and solve for lambda. So we cross multiply the energy with the lambda to solve for lambda. Lambda is HC over energy, and then we can just plug the numbers in. So we have Planck's constant, we have the speed of light, and then we divide that by our energy calculation from the previous step, and then we convert it into nanometers. Finally, we get 94.96 nanometers. We can look that up on a spectrochemical profile, and we can identify it as ultraviolet light. Okay, essentially, I'll go back. Uh, there's maybe a, a statement I can make about, maybe I can put it here. Yeah, let me put it here. I'm sure this comes up in a slide in a minute, but just in case it doesn't. Um, 
there's some transitions that's probably a good idea to just get a feel for now. So if you go from n x down to n one, that's always ultraviolet. So whenever you go from a higher level down to n equals one, it's always ultraviolet. If you go from n x down to n equals two, it's always visible. So any higher orbit down to n equals two. Sorry, I meant to go to n equals one with the first arrow. Down to n equals two with the second arrow, it's always visible. If you go from any higher value down to n equals three, uh, four, five, whatever, it's always infrared. Okay, so. Um, so they're the three I would remember. N equals one, ultraviolet. N equals two, visible. N equals three or higher, infrared. Look at that one. Okay. So this was around 1913 up until around 1926-ish. And then there was an historical event called the Solvay Comp one. Well, it's still going on, but there was a very famous event. It's still going on today, but the historically important one happened in 1927. This is where new wave mechanical quantum mechanics was born. So you've got Einstein, Heisenberg, uh, Schro Schrodinger, uh, Dirac, who else? Oppenheimer of the, actually, I'm not 100% sure Oppenheimer was at the conference, but he was a player at the time. He was definitely a figure at the time. Um, who else would you know? Lorentz. Anyway, all the big names in, in quantum mechanics, this is when they were doing their thing in the late 1920s. Um, and they solidified quantum mechanics, and it really hasn't changed since 1927. Um, we realized, or people realized that Bohr's atomic model only works for a single electron uh, atom. It only works for electron. It only works for an atom with one electron, which means it only works for hydrogen. So what about the other 117 atoms? So there was some refining of the idea. So rather than all bits, which are linked only with the Bohr atomic model, we have orbitals. I'm asking you for an annotation tool. No, now there's a ruler. Okay, very good. I don't want a ruler, so let me undo that. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of the ruler. I don't know what I did. I just want to draw and zoom doesn't want me to draw. Okay. So we've gone from orbits to orbitals. Okay, orbits to orbitals. I wouldn't even know how to get rid of that ruler. I don't know what I did. Okay. Oh, now I'm just the X is on. You might have to click the top where it says ruler. It says ruler. Where does it say ruler? At the top of um the slide where all the pen pens and the drawing tools are it says Mine, you're slide. behind like three other windows how how on earth did they hit something behind three other windows seriously <laughs> that's how it came now i'm just putting x's on top of it maybe not <laughs> oh there we go all right it just it's just my love affair with zoom it's so clunky you know They've had so long to make it less country, but anyway. All right. Um, thanks for the thanks for the advice. Okay, so we have orbitals, and to be honest, in in Chem sixty five, knowing that there's a word called orbital is great. In Gen Chem, you learn how to draw them and all that, but again, we're just trying to. The purpose of Chem 65 is so that you don't show up to Gen Chem and die. So we're, we're on life preservation mode in Chem 65. 
um, we're not trying to, um, you know, Chem 65 is still a pre-college pre level class. We're, we're trying to get ready for, for Gen Chem um, because we found out that Gen Chem just hammers you in the way. Okay. Um, so we have uh, orbitals and basically for now it's just a, a an orbital is a three-dimensional solution to the Schrodinger equation and it's a probabilistic three-dimensional shape within which up to two electrons can exist so uh, if that sounds really abstract it really is abstract um, and again you know in the course of learn in chemistry, you'll learn how to draw them. You'll get a bit more comfortable. For us in Chem 65, it's just a name where electrons live. Okay, we have seen, we have seen the principle, and that should be AL, shouldn't be principle, it should be principal, principal quantum number N. There are three other quantum numbers that we'll need to be aware of. And you would definitely inspect them when you look at quantum numbers, definitely do them in order. So you have principal quantum number N, which is the energy. You have orbital angular momentum quantum number L, which um, essentially is the number of angular nodes. It also gives the orbital shape. So it also equals the number of angular nodes. A node is when the zero solution to the Schrodinger equation. So um, the only thing you really need to know of anything in Chem 65 about a node, energy is proportional to the number of nodes. So for larger N values, you would expect larger L values. Okay, magnetic quantum number M sub L, uh, this, is the Z component of L. Again, we go into a lot more detail in Gen Chem. Z component, where Z is the up and down axis. So typically in chemistry, up and down is the Z axis. So when I say the Z component, I mean the component of M that goes up and down. So the Z component of L, all right. And then the electron spin quantum number, M sub S, is literally the spin orientation, whether it's up or down, um, of the of the electron. Um, okay, so let's. So definitely, quantum numbers are abstract to describe. They're pretty simple to to assign, though. Uh, I I would be shocked if anyone had a hard time assigning them after ten minutes of effort. Okay, so when we write electron configuration, and that's where we're headed now, we're gonna actually be using quantum numbers or another way of thinking about it. If you write electron configuration, you're basically coding quantum numbers into your electron configuration. So what is an electron configuration? An electron configuration is you declaring where the electrons live in an atom. So for example, sulfur, uh, we can see the symbol S here. Now, oddly enough, I don't have a pair of the cable, but I'm pretty sure that sulfur has an atomic number of 16. Um, that means it has 16 electrons. So again, for my students, I've posted videos on my canvas shell where I literally hold up a periodic table and I show you how to write electron configurations. That's not what I'm going to do in this, otherwise the video would be hours long. I'm just going to assume that you've watched them and this is the icing on the cake video. So you would read the periodic table from top left to straight, ac <clears throat> straight across horizontally to the right. Then you would go to the second line and read across horizontally. Then you go to the third line. <coughs> So just the way you would read a book, you know, you read the book from the top left, line by line, to the bottom right. That's exactly how you read the product data. 
we always start in period one in the S block, and there is only two electrons possible in period one. Then we go to period two. We're in the S block. We put our two electrons in, but then we cross over to the P block in period two, and we can see that we have six electrons we can add there. Then we're in period three. So again, this line by line reading of the periodic table is where these coefficient numbers are coming from. The letters S and P represented here are the blocks in the periodic table. Again, my other videos will show you that. In short, these 16 electrons, uh oh, now apparently I've paused sharing. How did I do that? Okay, there we go. So these, um, 16 electrons on sulfur, it's these two, plus these two is four, plus these six is 10, plus these two is 12, plus these four is 16. I have six valence electrons, so I have six valence electrons. I have 16 total, so 16 electrons is 10 core electrons plus 16 valence electrons. And 16, remember, is the atomic number Z. Okay, where I'm taking my chemical symbol, which has two numbers. So the smaller of the two, so A is always greater than or larger than Z. So every element has two numbers. The smaller of the two is the number of electrons. In this case, the number of electrons is 16. That's the total number, and I have 10 core and 6 valence. The valence electrons have the highest principal quantum number. So out of all these quantum numbers, I have three types of quantum number, three types of n quantum number. I have n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. 3 is the highest. So I look at all the electrons in n equals 3. I have 6 electrons in n equals 3. I have six valence electrons. Um, I can write an orbital diagram where, again, I don't draw the actual shape of the orbital. I can just draw it as a box. So, for example, if I wanted to draw the orbital diagram for sulfur, I could do a box and call it 1s. I could do a box and call it 2s. So I'm basically copying the electron configuration here. I could have three boxes and call them 2p. I can have another box, 3s, another box, 3p. And then I'm going to add electrons to it. <clears throat> now, you can't just add electrons any old way. There are two rules that we follow when we add electrons. And, and we have to follow these because they provide the correct quantum numbers. We won't get into the detail of why these rules are the way they are. That's the purview of GenChem. Um, so this we're just trying to at least broach a couple of intro topics in this course. We're not going to get to it. We're not going to get to all the meat that will be in the next one. But there are two rules called Hunt's first rule and Pauli exclusion principle. Basically, Hunt's first rule says that you put one electron in a box before you put two electrons in a box uh, for a given energy. So for a 1s box, I put one electron in at a time. And then I put a second one in, and the second one has to be upside down compared to the first one. So you'll notice these are always, if you have two electrons in a box, they're always up and down. Think of it like shoes in a shoe box. You know, you always put them heels opposite each other. You don't put them heels on the same side. That would be a good way to think about that. Putting one electron in a box before you pair them up is Hunt's first rule. When you do pair them up, having them anti-parallel, have the arrows in opposite directions, that's Pauli exclusion. So up, down, we'll do the same for 2s2, up, down. 
Now 2P, there are three boxes of the same energy. So I fill one box at a time. That's Hunt's first rule. Now I make them filled. Pauli exclusion says that you make them anti-parallel. 3S2, up Hunt's rule, down again, Pauli exclusion. And then I've got to put four electrons in these last three boxes. So I put one in each, that's Hunt's first rule. And then I double up to put that fourth one in, Pauli exclusion. So I don't just fill them left to right, I have to follow those two rules. Again, I have more videos for my students viewing and reading. Okay. Um, so let's move on. Okay. Okay. Um, that one. Did I just oscillate the slide? I don't think I did. Okay. Sorry, I've got a big thing right in front of my screen. Okay. I can't catch a break because then. Why would you put okay? Uh Gisela, can you see can you see a big box right at the top of my screen? No. No? Okay, it must just be for me. It's always right in the room. Oh, there it goes. It's gone. Okay. Um, what if we have charges on on um, on elements? Okay. So let's look at chlorine, and then I'll go back and look at sulfur, uh, just to give just to show you how you handle charges. So again, this video is not to give you exhaustive practice on how to do this stuff. Um, Nobody wants to watch a video where you're exhaustively practicing, um, but you you should exhaustively practice. Um, but this is just to show you how to do an example. Then you exhaustively practice after that. Um, so, for example, if I want to draw, let's see, I'm actually going to insert a slide because we need some space. All right, so I'm gonna right on this so we had sulfur and now i'm going to undo that and get the correct annotation for that all right we had sulfur with its 16 electrons 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p4 right that was our 16 electrons total. Now sulfur wants to form a negative two charge. Sulfur is in the same group as oxygen, and we know that oxygen wants to form a negative two charge. Everything in group 16 wants to form a negative two charge. Sulfur wants to form a negative two charge. How does it do it? It's going to lose two of its valence electrons. So it's going to, sorry, it wants to gain an extra two valence electrons to gain an extra two charges. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So the four has become six because I've gone from a zero charge to a two charge. So that increase in charge by two points is because the four became a six. Now, there's something called the noble gas abbreviation. So I can take my electron configuration and I, I can look at the last instance where I wrote P6. So if you look where I've written P6, I've got 10 electrons. Well, that is neon. So I can write neon in square brackets and then just write 3s2, 3p4. So the one on the left with all the letters and the number with all the numbers is called the full electron configuration. The one on the right with the noble gas, the group 18 element in square brackets, that's called the noble gas abbreviation of the electron configuration. You should be familiar with both and you should uh, provide what's asked for. So if you're asked for the full 
non-abbreviated version, don't abbreviate it. If you're asked for the abbreviated version, then go ahead and abbreviate it. Again, if I were to use the noble gas abbreviation here, it would be neon uh, 3S2 3P6. All right. And neon, by the way, just in case that wasn't clear, neon is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. So literally, I can abbreviate 1S2, 2S2, 2P6 as just the element neon in square brackets. Okay. Chlorine, which is on the next slide, but I can do it better here if I just write it. Chlorine, let's do chlorine before we do chlorine minus. Chlorine has 17 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2, 3p5. We could write chlorine as neon 3s2, 3p5. Chlorine now wants to gain one electron, <clears throat> so that five is going to become a six. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Or we can just write neon, 3s2, 3p6. Okay, again, the no charge has become a one charge because the five has now become a six. Okay. Um, notice what they're all doing. When you form a charge, you're always, and pretty much you're always ending up with a six at the end of your electron configuration. So neon 3s2, 3p6 is actually the same as argon, right? So why do elements form charges? Because they want to become the same. They want to have the same electron configuration as a specific noble gas. So we've seen here that these elements, at least the ones we've seen so far, elements adopt charges. To become isoelectronic with the noble gas. So the noble gas is the group 18 element. They have a specific one in mind. For a non-metal, it's always the noble gas at the end of the period. For metals, it's always the noble gas in the period above, and we'll see metal examples in a second. Isoelectronic means same electron configuration. Okay. Isoelectronic means same electron configuration. Um, Right, non-metal, so that was non-metals. Metals do something similar. So let's just look at a couple of examples of metals. Let's look at sodium with its 11 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So metals lose electrons, right? Metals want to form Char uh, plus charged ions or cations. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So I've completely lost the 3s1. It's gone. I don't write 3s0. It's just gone. So now I'm isoelectronic with neon. So sodium targets neon, which is in the period above it. Chlorine targets argon, which is in the same period. Sulfur uh, also targets argon. 
And I think we saw, what else did we see? Sul uh, and we saw oxygen, we saw sulfur and chlorine. Okay, so same idea. You are forming an ion because you want to be isoelectronic with a specific noble gas. So this is the motivating factor for elements forming ions. I paused the screen again. How did I do it? I have paused sharing my screen and I don't know how I've done it. Oh, uh, this is uh, my my fault for saying bad things about Zoom. The Zoom share, okay. I don't know how I'm doing it. It's so touchy. Zoom is so sensitive, so fragile. Okay. All right. All right, let's see, we're running out of times and nobody watches a long video. Um, so I'm gonna try and keep this as wee as possible or I might have to do a splinter again. My goodness. Um, yeah, so I think we've talked about this already. Um, this is just the, the use of a noble gas uh, abbreviation. I don't think there's anything new on that slide. We've talked about Powell exclusion principle and Hunt's rule. So there's nothing new on that slide. What's on this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can talk about periodic trends. Yeah. Okay, so we know what motivates atoms. They want to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. Metals do it by losing valence electrons. Nonmetals do it by gaining valence electrons. They end when they have P6 at the end of their electron configuration. Um, we can have periodic trends. So um, in Chem 65, look, there's one major thing you have to know. And I'm not going to dumb it down, but I'll give you in a way that a five-year-old could appreciate. And again, that doesn't mean it's dumbed down. That just means it's that straightforward. All right. So check, check out how straightforward this is. You've got your periodic table. You've got the bottom left and the top right. Draw a line. This is the strong end. It's also the small end. This is the large end. It's also the weak end. So, the strongest elements in the periodic table, what does that mean? That means the elements that it's hardest to remove electrons from, or the elements that can pull electrons towards themselves, you know, literally the strong elements, they're all in the top right of the periodic table. The farther away you get from the top right of the periodic table towards the tail of this arrow, the weaker you get. So we have if I superimpose where the nonmetals are here, the nonmetals are all here, right? Towards the head of this arrow. So the reason why nonmetals fill the valence shell is because they're strong, right? They're strong, so they acquire extra electrons. The reason why the metals, so the metals are all in the non shaded part. The reason why the metals tend to lose their valence electrons is because they're weak. That's why they do it. Uh, so you could be asked, you know, is this element X larger or smaller than this element Y? Well, X is closer to the tail end of the arrow. Y is closer to the head of the arrow. So X is going to be larger than Y. You know, which is larger or smaller, X or Z? Well, Z is closer to the tail of the arrow. Z is larger than X. Z is also larger than Y. Um, so if you just remember large and weak at the bottom left, strong and small at the top right, you know more than enough periodic trends for Chem 65. Uh, 
In another course, we'll look at the why it's like that. Here, we're just not there yet. We're just trying to learn some, some basic facts. Um, ionization energy, that's what I've just described as strong. So this is what I called strength. Electron affinity, strength. So ionization energy and electron affinity are largest towards the top right of the periodic table. Um, and then size, I think I've missed size. Yeah, radius is size. So again, size and strength, they're the vernacular labels. Atomic radius is the uh, scientific label for size. And then there's a bunch of ways you can talk about strength. Ionization energy is one of them. Electron affinity is one of them. There are others, electronegativity is another one. But the two in these slides are ionization energy and electron affinity. Um, so obviously this would be size. Okay. Okay. And then um, this one, this number six in particular, I would say I'd like my students to have on the radar. Um, just the behavior of different oxides. So an oxide, a metal oxide is obviously a mixture of metal and oxygen. Metal oxides form bases in solutions. So metal oxides are basic. So that means they um, are the opposite of acids. They have a pH greater than seven. Non-metal oxides, so carbon here is a non-metal, they tend to form acidic solutions. This is a useful fact that will definitely be helpful, not only in Chem 65, but in Gen Chem as well. This is one reason why we call sodium an alkali metal. Alkali is another word for base. Um, so I would definitely like my students to know item six. Um, item five uh, is not that important for us right, right now. Um, we'll look at redox in another chapter. So for right now, um, it's not that important, but number six is. Okay, so if I ever want my students to watch a 50 minute video, I have to stop it now.